Welcome back to the Tech Ed Podcast. I am your host, Matt Kirkner. Regular listeners to our podcast know that I serve as a volunteer on the national board of the Smart Automation Certification Alliance. And last year, we held a leadership panel with some of the most recognizable organizations, some of the most recognizable manufacturers in the world of advanced manufacturing. For the next two episodes of the podcast this week and next week, we will be reviewing that leadership panel. We are going to hear from some of these amazing companies on why they are supporting the Smart Automation Certification Alliance. The reason I support that organization is they are better than anybody doing a phenomenal job of creating a common language between manufacturing, specifically Industry 4.0 advanced manufacturing, and the world of education. So they're creating a common language between those two scenarios, between those two worlds, and creating a future for partnerships between educators and industrial employers as we define what it is that industrial employers are looking for when they hire Industry 4.0 talent. Some of the companies that you're going to be hearing from are companies like Harley-Davidson, Plexus, Generac, Greenheck, Kohler, Sargento, Ashley Furniture, SC Johnson, Rockwell Automation, and of course, from the folks at the Smart Automation Certification Alliance. Welcome to the Tech Ed Podcast, where we visit with leaders who are shaping, innovating, and disrupting technical education. People who are not afraid to think differently, not afraid to try something new, all with the goal of securing the American dream for the next generation of STEM and workforce talent. In this first episode of our two episode series, we are going to talk about the emergence of Industry 4.0 technology in the world of manufacturing. In this episode, we are going to hear from guests such as companies like Harley-Davidson, Plexus, Generac, Greenheck, and Kohler Company. Every one of these people are absolute experts on how Industry 4.0 technology is transforming their business. If you're a listener to this podcast, you know that when we talk about Industry 4.0 technology, we are talking about digital twins, artificial intelligence, machine learning, cyber physical systems, additive manufacturing. It's just incredible how so many of these technologies and other advanced technologies are changing manufacturing. So as we listen to these guests, I want you to think about how this industry 4.0 technology is absolutely reframing their entire approach to advanced manufacturing and what we need to be doing about it, both as industrial employers and as educators as we look to the future. Now, for those of you that aren't familiar with SACA, are not familiar with the Smart Automation Certification Alliance, I'm going to do about a 45 second to maybe minute and a half primer. This could go on for an hour. We don't have an hour. I just want to make sure people understand a little bit about the Smart Automation Certification Alliance, which was an organization born by and of industrial employers identifying skills and competencies in industry 4.0. Manufacturing technology is advancing at warp speed. We all know that. And so Jim Wall, who will join us later and his team, worked with industrial employers all over the globe, literally all over the globe, to define competencies in Industry 4.0, asking the question, when you hire people, when you promote people in your organization around advanced manufacturing, what is it that you want those people to know? What do you want them to be able to do? And it doesn't matter if you're at the left side of your screen, associate certifications, entry level, advanced manufacturing positions and basic and advanced operations, robot system operations, or IIoT, or moving through the middle where we might be dealing with people in a technician role, all the way to the right, somebody with a degree in engineering as it relates to Industry 4.0. There are a handful of things we've already touched on that make SACA unique. The first big one is that the skills are defined by industrial employers, and we will hear from many of them today. These competencies came from people hiring people today, hiring our students, hiring our incumbent workers, hiring our transitioning workers in manufacturing. That's who defined the competencies covered by the certifications. Secondly, these certifications are incredibly affordable. If a school or company is a member of the Alliance, if for a high school, that's $500 a year for a huge company. 
that's $3,500 a year. And there's membership levels in between unlimited certifications for students and employees so that we can identify and certify that an employee, that a student, that anybody who goes through the SACA process has those competencies when they get to the workplace. So that is what SACA is all about. That is what makes SACA unique. And we are going to begin now uh, walking through with some of the most recognizable brands in the state of Wisconsin. And I would argue some of the most recognizable brands across the globe as we listen to experts in Industry 4.0, people who have participated on the SACA technical work groups, the people who have defined these competencies and hear what they have to say about advancing manufacturing technology and making sure that our students, our learners, and our incumbent employees are ready for advanced manufacturing opportunities. My first guest is a great, great friend of mine, a gentleman by the name of Al Doty. His title is Advanced Manufacturing Chief Engineer for none other than Harley Davidson Motorcycle Company. Al, it's so great to have you with us. And I have a, a question for you, Al. You know, you have served on the, the SACA technical work groups and you've had members of your team from all over the United States do the same. In this world of advanced manufacturing, how do you and how does Harley Davidson see the world of manufacturing changing in the era of Industry 4.0? You know, we really lean into uh, automation and 4.0 related related technologies to uh, maintain and extend our competitiveness. It's very important, especially being a, a U.S. manufacturer. It's, it's a critical piece of the strategy to uh, ensure U.S. manufacturing stays competitive. Now, what really got my attention with SACA is we try to do that. We also find a skills gap. And uh, you know, my perception is that if you're passionate about SACA, you're, you're passionate about these type of technologies, you want to put the effort forward to uh, learn and uh, progress in your career. And that's the passion and the people with that type of skill set and people that are willing to develop those type of skill sets because it is a lifelong learning endeavor because these technologies change rapidly. It's, it's very important. So it's very important to the business. And uh, the other thing is the workforce where, you know, the people that develop these skill sets, they end up, they have options, right? And pay is always one piece of the equation and these skill sets, you know, there's, there's demand for them and we have a hard time finding them and you need to pay competitively. That's a piece of it, but it's also what interests them. So it's kind of one begets the other as we harness emerging technology to become competitive in, in manufacturing, just to keep quality high and cost low and uh, address safety and all the other issues that, that all manufacturers are trying to address. The more you embrace that, the more it attracts people. You need to have the right culture to embrace it. And, and they want to they want to believe that you're going to help them along the way to get to where they need to be. Very, very timely example, Al, of exactly uh, where Industry 4.0 can improve lives, right? As we look at work-life balance, as we look at opportunities to have students, learners, new employees gain competencies that reduce the time to do certain tasks in manufacturing and certainly automation, certainly advancing manufacturing technology plays a huge, huge role in that. Al, just a great example and a great observation. Appreciate you being with us very, very much. Al Doty, Advanced Manufacturing Chief Engineer from Harley-Davidson Motor Company. And next on our list, uh, another great friend of mine, introducing my, my good friend, Scott Tooney. Now, Scott is the president uh, for Plexus, really across uh, all of the Americas. And Scott and I have known each other for a number of years, served on a, a board together for a company that I was actually CEO of. I, I learned a tremendous amount from Scott, as a matter of fact, especially as uh, advanced manufacturing and industry 4.0 technologies were starting to cross over with the supply chain. And Plexus, for our, our attendees who don't know, is a company that's been around since the late 1970s, 19,000 employees. So this is a big company. Uh, and they're leaders in design and manufacturing and supply chain and aftermarket services, particularly as it relates to complex electronics products. And that's really the, the genesis of my question, Scott. You know, as we talk about Industry 4.0 technology, your company manufactures some of the most complex electronics products literally on the globe. And not only are you implementing Industry 4.0 manufacturing practices in your business, but you are working with other companies that are doing exactly the same thing. Would be curious from your vantage point, Scott, what trends are you seeing emerge in the world of Industry 4.0 manufacturing? 
So a, a couple of things I'd point out. I think I think the first trend that, that many people probably are seeing is and point out is the amount of interoperability. We're seeing a significant increase um, in the level of system integration you know, required across the suite of our manufacturing execution systems. And this is really imperative in our pursuit of zero defect culture. You had mentioned some of the products that we we build, you know, class three medical devices that are invasive, you know, things that are in aerospace. So we really need to have a zero defect culture. And when we talk of zero defect culture, it really is how we um, enable our employees and empower them to, you know, accept no defect, make no defect and pass no defect on. So when we look at industry 4.0, it really gives us our ability to now control, monitor and adjust the uh, parameters automatically you know, based on the observed defects or process indicators that we're seeing. So this, this interoperability is obviously coming into play. I would, you know, season that a little bit with what people are seeing is that as you connect more machines and have more things set up in, internally with the cloud, the, you know, support and alignment with IT and your supply base is really critical to limit, you know, any cybersecurity type issues that may come in into play through, um, through those means as far as in a, an inroad to your, your IT or, or information system. The second thing I would look at is, is the amount of robotics and automation that we're seeing. You know, this is really key to delivering higher levels of repeatability and enabling our, our talented employees to be utilized elsewhere in the business through reskilling. So leveraging, again, robotics and automation, again, with these uh, connected equipment is a huge lever as we drive and pursue operational excellence and how we reduce our transformation costs to stay um, competitive and differentiate. And then the third thing that, that we're seeing, and this is, is really looking as we get more into system integration is a trend towards um, digital twins. Digital twin is a, a virtual representation that serves as the, the real-time uh, digital counterpart uh, of a physical object or process. So our customers are requiring more information related to the, the pedigree of the manufacturing of the product, creating digital twin um, to collect these data as a repository for all the build parameters, really enables Plexus to virtually analyze um, the builds in the conditions that they are, should we need to do anything in the field or represent or recreate the, the build of the products. So those are probably three things, Matt, that I would see. I, I would also, you know, as we go forward and, and look at this, I think one thing I always keep in the back of my my mind as we look to embrace technology and, and engineering is, is important to remember to have a you know a strong business strategy as a, a foundation and use that to determine your future state and then enabling technology to enhance it and uh, you know don't you know let the technology alone drive your future state or strategy. I think all these things we're talking about needs to play a key role in your overall business strategy and how you differentiate and show value to your customers. Excellent, Scott. And thank you. I think you make some really, really good observations. First of all, who would have thought 10 years later when you and I were sitting around the board table 10 years ago that we would be talking about things like digital twins. So incredible technology, Scott's comments on interoperability, on robotics and automation. And I think he makes a great point about making sure that as we push technology into our manufacturing plants, we're not just doing it for technology's sake, but we're doing it because it has a greater purpose, because it's driving out costs, because it's improving quality, it's improving safety, what have you. So some great observations from my friend, Scott Tooney. Andy Martin is a great guy, Senior Director of Manufacturing for a company many of you are familiar with, a company called Generac, founded all the way back in 1959, huge manufacturer of home standby generators, light towers, trailer mounted generators, and so on. I had the opportunity to uh, tour one of Andy's plants about two or three weeks ago. Incredible, the amount of automation, the amount of control systems, of data acquisition, data analysis that is taking place in their manufacturing environment as they transform their business to an industry 4.0 world. I've known Andy for a number of years. He and I are actually both Milwaukee Business Journal 40 under 40 alums. And if you know how old I am now, that goes back a little ways, but uh, a great partner, great supporter of SACA. Andy has served on several of the technical work groups. What are the benefits to Generac of investments, not just in SACA, but in industry 4.0 technology within their plant. So over the years, Generac seen a, you know, a lot of growth, especially over the last couple of years, the growth has really been unforeseen. So as we look at adding capability and capacity to our facilities, um, we've been looking at automation for many reasons. So some is the growth, some is also with the um, challenging 
uh, workforce these days and the ability to find people. Um, we're looking at automation to you know, help us um, get more out with maybe more efficient processes. And then we can tie safety and, and quality in that as well. So we're looking to, with the higher volumes, looking at how we make safer processes through automation, as well as improving the quality of our product. So as most of you know, as you implement automation, you tend to find all the variation in your parts and, and process and products. So we're looking as we implement automation as that opportunity to improve the quality of our products as well. Some great observations and how Industry 4.0 Technology is transforming the way that his company, Generac, manufactures its products. And we really appreciate Andy's participation, not just in our webinar today, but certainly on the technical work groups defining competencies for SACA. And moving on to our next guest, Michael DeBru, spent plenty of time on the SACA technical work groups. Michael is the senior mechanical and automation engineer and engineering supervisor for GreenHack Fan Corporation. Michael, great to have you on board. Yeah, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. We are really excited to have you here as well. If you don't know their products, uh, you've certainly been around them. They offer a wide range of non-residential air movement products. So think about the air duct work and the ventilation systems in hospitals, offices, hotels, shopping malls, schools, and so on. That's their company. And we're really excited to have Michael on board. But our question For you, Michael, especially since you participated extensively on these technical work groups, and not just that, you've also just launched a training program for incoming employees at GreenHack that teaches many of the same competencies that have been embedded in the SACA credentials. I'd like for you to, if you would be willing uh, to share some examples of advanced manufacturing technologies in place at GreenHack Fan Corporation. Sure. I'll hone in on one specific machine that really grabs my uh, my mind when I think of you know a cutting edge or high technology or a very critical asset in our factories. So great intro to GreenHack, but like Matt said, we're one of the world's leading suppliers of air movement and control equipment. And I'm going to look at we also have a louvers division, which we're kind of in a scaling mode in that we're we've been opening factories um, across the U.S. and also across the globe. We now have factories in Wisconsin, Minnesota, California, Kentucky. North Carolina, Oklahoma, and even India and Mexico. And I might be forgetting a couple. But that being said, we just, I'm going to say, duplicated a louvers factory in Shelby, North Carolina. And one of the most critical assets that or machines that I can think of in all of Green Heck, out of all of our business units, all of our brands, all of our factories, is our, we call it the SRS, and it stands for the Storage Retrieval System. We turned the key on this machine just probably, you know, within a month ago to enable uh, the North Carolina factory to start making Louvers product. So what we're looking at here is obviously we're seeing a very substantial racking system that's housing 591, um, I'll call them pallets. We sometimes refer to them as coffins, that each one of them, we store about 159 unique extrusions among those 591 coffins of aluminum extruded material. And what this machine does is that blue cart with the American flag on the left there, that goes to a certain coffin location and it peels it out of the racking system, brings it to one of seven saw conveyor stations, which you can kind of see on the right side picture there. Um, This was in the middle of our build, but all those conveyors on the bottom side with the yellow guarding sheet metal, uh, those are all the saw conveyors going to automated saw cutting stations. So... What makes Saka important to GreenHack is that, you know, time is a very a critical space. You know, the Amazon has shown us that companies, um, time is a space where companies can either win or lose or gain market share. So when we're, when we're trying to be strategic and offer our customer base, you know, we call it quick builds or, or fast pass products that we have optimized manufacturing methods for, that we're trying to ship product from order within three days while also handling our everyday volume, time is extremely critical. So what makes Saka important to us is that we need to make sure that we are getting personnel and new talent into our company that speaks modern manufacturing languages and is familiar with industry 4.0 fundamentals. Because at the end of the day, that's, that's what we're really standing on the gas pedal and getting to right now is the next level of remote visibility, reporting, real-time decision-making. And that's my selfish opinion is what Industry 4.0 is all about. But yeah, I would say this is probably one of our 
most critical machines to um, a factory. If this goes down, the factory gets starved pretty quickly. So we have to make sure we have maintenance personnel, operations personnel that are all, you know, watered with information and skills and knowledge when they come into Green Tech because they're operating very critical equipment. And what a great example, Michael. I mean, great comments. And just, you know, to look at these pictures and see the advanced technology you're using really shows how industry 4.0 technology touches uh, manufacturing, supply chain, inventory, really across the whole spectrum. And really appreciate your participation in the Socket Technical Work Groups. And, and, and I think the really acute and interesting comments about why it's so important to you and to Green Heck Fan. And pleasure working with you. And I appreciate having you on today. Uh, our next guest, another great Wisconsin employer with some really interesting observations on Industry 4.0 from maybe a little bit different angle. Jim Walter is the IT manager for Smart Factory Deployment. How cool is that title for Kohler Company? And Jim, really good to have you on board today. Yeah, happy to be here. So uh, most of us know Kohler. Uh, you know it for its plumbing products. Uh, you have it in your kitchen, in your bathrooms, very likely, uh, and elsewhere. But they also manufacture furniture, uh, cabinetry, tile, engines, generators. They're involved in a wide variety of business. And in as much as Jim uh, sees IT and OT technology in the world of smart factory and industry 4.0. I'd like Jim to pose this question to you. You've participated in the SACA technical work groups. You have, as we suggest, a really unique perspective uh, on industry 4.0, seeing it as some of us don't necessarily have a chance to from the IT side. Uh, you've also invested in training your IT team on operations technology, which was a really fun initiative to work with you on. How do you see the worlds of IT and OT converging now and in the future, Jim? Yeah, so as Matt mentioned, I'm kind of the sore thumb because I'm the IT guy and amongst a bunch of manufacturing people. But um, back in July, they formed the Smart Factory Deployment Team, who I'm fortunate to be the manager for. And I had come from a career of IT, so um, old school IT. My, my team, uh, a lot of them came from business background, but have been in IT a long time. So I reached out to Matt last summer and told him what team that I'm forming and said, we're going to have a lot more touches of OT in the future. And so I asked set, uh, for help setting up a curriculum that we called OT for IT professionals. I had my new team go through that, and it was so popular that we opened it up to the rest of IT. So a lot of hardcore IT, like the infrastructure and security people, have taken part in the training as well. So historically, in my experience, IT and OT, we very seldom interacted. We were so busy standing up ERP systems that we didn't reach out to the shop floor very often. Our infrastructure guys were worried about the data center and the desktops to keep running and stuff like that. Meanwhile, the OT guys were worried about keeping the plant floor running, to, and they didn't spend time worrying about us. I4O is forcing us, not even encouraging us, but forcing us to break down those silos and start to learn to work together. And the first step in that was for us to start to speak OT's language. And that was the training that we forced our people to go through or encourage your people to go, should, shouldn't say forced. IT is really good at some stuff like governance and security and things like that. Um, as OT starts to play a more mission critical role on the manufacturing floor, we can't ignore the governance and the security aspect of OT systems anymore. And anybody that watches the news and doesn't think, OT security is important, just isn't paying attention. You think of two circles with one being IT and one being OT. As OT systems start to become more IT-like, they shift one direction. And as IT systems start to have products that um, are more interest to the shop floor, we start to shift that circle. So now we have a Venn diagram. There's overlap now. I expect that overlap to continue. One time I read a quote that said, today there's OT and there's IT, and tomorrow there'll be just BT. And I think that's really where we're headed is that there's not going to be a distinction anymore. Fantastic. And what a great observation on a number of different levels, Jim, you know, certainly from your IT standpoint, I would call you anything but a sore thumb. I would say you're a breath of fresh air, you know, viewing OT from the IT side and, and really your examples of how you're preparing your workforce on the IT side for this convergence. So very, very important. Well, what a fantastic episode of the Tech Ed Podcast. We listen to folks from companies like Harley Davidson and Plexus, Kohler, Greenheck, Generac, talking about how Industry 4.0 is affecting the world of manufacturing. And by now, you know that it is having a huge impact 
on the world of advanced manufacturing. So thanks to these guests for spending some time with us. And we are going to talk now just a little bit about what you're going to hear next week if you join us. So now that we know what is Industry 4.0 technology, how is it affecting manufacturing? We want to learn from some other organizations how advanced manufacturing is preparing talent for the future, how they are building partnerships with educators to make sure that the path is paved, that the road is paved for the future of advanced manufacturing, learning, training, and education. So next week, we will hear from representatives of Sargento, Ashley Furniture, SC Johnson, and Rockwell Automation. You won't want to miss next week's episode. In the meantime, to learn more about the Smart Automation Certification Alliance, visit SACA.org. That is S-A-C-A org where you can learn all about the Smart Automation Certification Alliance's credentials and approaches to manufacturers, approaches to advanced manufacturing and education. We'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Tech Ed Podcast. If you haven't already, subscribe, leave a review, and if you like this episode, share it with a friend. New episodes launch every Tuesday, so listen in next week.